All right. Well, thanks very much for coming. Um, as Jeremy said, uh, please do interrupt uh, um, with questions <clears throat> during the talk. Um, I, I always enjoy interactive talk uh, more than just uh, uh, a monologue. So <clears throat> I want to start with a very simple um, computational problem, uh, which, which is, has the following specification. Uh, this is called a prefix sum, or more generally, a left scan. Uh, and the, the idea is that we have a, a collection of inputs, values, uh, the AIs, and we want to generate a collection of values out, the BKs. And the rule is, is simply this, that the, each output is the sum of the previous inputs. Okay, So this is called an, an exclusive uh, left scan. Exclusive means uh, that the kth output does not include the uh, kth input, just only, only the uh, values up before it. Okay. Now here's a picture of a computation. This is an efficient sequential scan. So um, if you have a mid 20th century uh, machine that was a genuinely sequential machine, uh, then you might want this kind of computation. Uh, and, and so you'll see each, uh, uh, there's, there's linear amount of work being done and uh, it takes linear time. So to, to read these slides, if um, I want you to read them operationally, left to right is time. Okay, and uh, and so that the time is going to depend on the data dependencies, and, and on a, a sequential machine or a machine that pretends to be sequential as a sequential instruction set. This is the kind of computation you might imagine. Each input you add to a kind of running sum. That's what's going on here. But uh, these sequential machines haven't existed for several decades, and 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 certainly uh, this is the century of parallelism. So if you care about performance, uh, we're going to care about. Uh, parallelism in significant amounts of massive parallelism. And so instead, we'll look for a computation that looks something like this. So this, this computation uh, gives exactly the same result, but it has a much lower uh, parallel time. So uh, the, the longest uh, data dependency, which is kind of the ideal parallel time. And sometimes that's called uh, depth. I'm going to refer to that as depth. So that there, there are sort of two operational uh, summaries here. One is the amount of work that's done, which is the number of operations, and the other is, is the, the total depth, which is the ideal parallel computation time. So the first uh, computation I showed you had linear work and linear depth, fine on a sequential machine, but there aren't really sequential machines anymore. Um, this computation has, has linear work and only logarithmic depth, which is a huge improvement. Okay. So where does this uh, where does this computation come from? How do how do you think about it? Well, around two thousand nine, I visited a, a colleague at, at CUDA. I'm sorry, a colleague at NVIDIA, uh, and he recommended that I look at CUDA. Uh, and so I got a book, this book, GPU Gems, and uh, I read through it. And I found this algorithm uh, here, and the, so this is a CUDA program. It's a, a multi-threaded uh, program. It's it's very efficient, and it it does exactly this computation here. Okay. But to me, it was quite mysterious. This thing, very low level, uh, quite complicated. You see that there's a bunch of stuff involving threads going on. There's a, a couple of loops, one going in, one coming out. Uh, in each loop, really only some of the threads are active uh, and the other threads are dormant. Okay. So there, there's a, a kind of a, a, a widen, uh, start out with, with a lot of threads going and then narrow and then uh, re-expand. Okay, that's what's going on here. And there's some funny index computation and a little bit of summation, right? So, so, so the, the actual work of the algorithm is in this line and uh, this line here, okay? So there's very little work, uh, very little of this code is the work. And I wanted to understand what is going on here. This to me looks like the output of a compiler. It doesn't look like, a, I, I look at this and I, I, I imagine there's some beautiful source program in some language uh, that's been lost uh, in antiquity, uh, and and I'm a sort of archaeologist, and I've stumbled across this uh, <clears throat> this finding, um, and I know that a you know civilized uh, society wouldn't generate wouldn't write code like this directly. This must be the output of some kind of compiler, and so I wonder what was the original uh, source code, and what was the language in which it was written, and what are the principles uh, on which the compiler is based that would generate this kind of code? That's a game I like to play. Uh, and so I, I uh, address this question, what, what's really going on here? And my assumption is that it's something beautiful, something beautiful and simple and elegant and powerful. Okay. Well, there was a clue in the article in the GPU Gems, uh, which, is, which was that the essence of uh, this CUDA program 
<clears throat> could be found in this Nestle program. So that it was, it was actually based on this Nestle program. Nestle is a language uh, designed by Guy Blelick at Carnegie Mellon. It's a, a functional array um, uh, language uh, for parallelism. So a functional parallel array language. And indeed it's much, much simpler. Um, <clears throat> Uh, kind of look at what's going on here. What are we doing? We're, we're taking some kind of uh, array input. If it's of size one, then we get just this output, um, a, a zero output, because remember it's it's the exclusive, so only the previous values. Um, and then what do we do? We kind of break up this array into uh, every other element. So all the even elements, all the odd uh, numbered elements. I don't mean the values are even and odd. I mean, the indices are even and odd, okay? And then there's some kind of summation going on where we uh, add up consecutive pairs, the uh, evens and odds, and then do a recursive scan on them. And then there's some funny kind of thing in the end where, uh, uh, again, we, we do a, a, a summation uh, and then an interleaving. And so this algorithm is much simpler. There's a lot less noise, uh, line noise uh, in it, but um, it's still quite mysterious to me. I, I don't know what is going on here. Why does it work? And then um, more importantly, how does it generalize? What, what are the principles, the essential principles uh, that are hiding behind this uh, bit of code? Uh, and then how, how can we apply those principles to uh, generate other algorithms? All right. So I thought about this question for a good while, and eventually it dawned on me that, that um, I was not going to come up with an answer if I think of it in terms of a good answer, thinking in terms of arrays, because it's not an array algorithm. Okay, it's an array program, of course. I can't argue with that. But the essential algorithm, the the, the kind of beautiful kernel behind it, it, is not about arrays. It's about something else. Okay, so what might it be? Well. I'm going to make this question uh, really clear because I think it's, it's, it's the most important question in the talk uh, and, and going forward and examining other uh, questions, trying to get to the essence of other algorithms. Okay, so we're going to start with this, this scan. And so I'm saying scan A for scan on arrays. Uh, and one thing I didn't mention is that this array only works if uh, the number of elements in, in your input and thus your output is a power of two. Okay, and this constraint shows up in a lot of algorithms, particularly parallel algorithms, uh, and it's already a clue that that uh, that there's something other than an array uh, under the surface here. Okay, so we're going to start with a scan, and it's going to take a, an array of size two to the d, uh, and generate an array of size two to the d. Okay, so that that's what we're trying to explain, and what I'm suggesting is that there's another data structure, there's another data type, and another algorithm. So I'm calling that mystery data type. D, uh, Z, and it's parameterized by D. So that's the kind of logarithm, the base two log of the size of the array. Okay, so we're gonna find, look for some other data type Z and some other operation scan Z uh, for, that goes from Z to Z. Okay, and the idea is, is this algorithm is gonna be much simpler. It's gonna be, uh, what, uh, beautifully compositional and it's gonna suggest other um, uh, variations. But of course, these two algorithms have to have something to do with each other. It's not just some uh, other data structure and algorithm. And what do they have to do with each other? It's exactly this. That um, an array is, um, array is, a, is essentially a string. It's not a string of characters. It's a string of, say, numbers. Okay. And, and so an array belongs to some language. All right. So given an array, if you want to understand what does it mean, uh, you have to know what language it's expressed in. Okay. And, uh, and once you know what language it's expressed and now you can parse it, you can extract it, semantic content, can manipulate it. You can also create uh, other strings like the output of this scan uh, and then convert from, uh, fr from that essential uh, representation uh, into a string again. So the string is like, uh, it, it, it's an interface, an interface to people maybe for languages. It's an interface to uh, uh, hard drive storage systems or something like that for, uh, for um, numerical arrays. But we have to know what the language is. And that language is this data structure Z, okay? And given, a, let's say the data structure is the grammar of the language. And given the grammar, we can parse and unparse. So the idea is that we want to explain this algorithm as, as a three phases, a parsing, a much more natural algorithm, and an unparsing. Okay? And so what it means for, for this algorithm to be correct, then, is, is that it correctly implements uh, scan A, implements scan Z. And what I mean specifically is that if we take an input, the array, we parse it into the natural data structure Z, and we perform the natural operation on it. Okay? 
we get the same result as if we had uh, done the array scan on the on the uh, array, okay, and then un, uh, and then parse the result into Z. So that that's the idea. What it means for uh, scan A to be an implementation of a more natural algorithm. <clears throat> All right. And the properties we want on scan Z is that it's, it's very simple to state and prove and generalize. Okay. <clears throat> Moreover, the parser needs to be like formulaic and Z. It's just like you could generate it with the parser generator, which is, which is um, and it's really even simpler than that. All right. Now for compositionality in this scan algorithm, I'm going to make a little tweak, which is to say that, that scan produces, whoops, Scan produces not just an array, but also a summary element. <clears throat> okay, so remember, it's an, it's an exclusive scan. So if you just output the, uh, in the output array, the first element is going to be zero. Okay, the last element is going to be the summary of all the elements before the last input. Okay, so, uh, so there's a bit of information which is lost, which is, which is the, the uh, sum of all of the elements. Okay, and that's going to be this final summary here. And including that is uh, critical in making the algorithm compositional. All right, so I made a first guess, um, informed by the fact that it was a uh, the array was restricted to be a size two to the n, uh, and the the clues about um, the the index arithmetic. I guess that there was really a binary tree going on. So I thought I'm a functional programmer. I know about binary trees. A binary tree is either a leaf. With a value, or it's a, or it's it's a, a a branching tree of a pair of binary trees. Now let me be more clear. There's uh, several different kinds of trees. I'm talking about leaf trees. Okay, so a leaf tree is a, a tree in which the the data are exactly at the leaves and never in the branch elements. Okay, so uh, so here's a description of the data type. This is in the programming language Haskell, uh, and we have two possibilities: uh, a leaf which contains a value, or a branch that contains two uh, two trees. Oh, can I in this... interrupt briefly? Yes, please. Um, there's a question in the chat from Dimitrios right. Katiniotis. Uh, so if you go back to the commuting diagram, slide 10, yeah. I guess, um, saying that par z returns the empty list um, and scan z returns the empty list will satisfy your commuting diagram. Just a pathological one that, that always returns oh. the empty list. Okay, so uh, scan returns the... Scan z. Yes. So par z is just const nil, const, const the empty list. Okay. And scan z is the function that takes the empty list to the empty list identity, say. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to satisfy the commuting diagram. Ah, ah, I see. Gotcha. Okay. So I, I think what I what I didn't make clear is, is that we're not looking for scan z. Uh, well, let me say that differently. Um, we're looking for the essence of what scanning is. That's going to be our scan z. Okay. And now, um, and now we want to say what it means for scan A to be correct. Okay, so our, it's it's not like we're we're just find any old scan Z and scan A. The idea is find an essential uh, definition of scan itself that is much much simpler than the program we're trying to prove cor correct or reason about or even ask ourselves what it means. So it, it it's not like find any old scan Z. Pick a scan and see that really captures the, the essence of what it means to do a, a scan. There's one way to say that more precisely, to say that uh, the um, parse has an inverse, right? That it's a bijection. You don't want it to be information losing. Um, well, actually, really, you might, you might yeah, imagine par parsing yeah, really scan doesn't, and an inverse. Yeah, parse really doesn't need to have an inverse. Here, here it has an inverse. Um, it doesn't, in general, need to have an inverse, and, and, and that's why I've that's why I've, I've given parse in both directions rather than kind of parse inverse. Hmm. Um, I, what I, where I thought you were going to go, maybe you are going to go there, is this diagram is a data refinement diagram. So with my Oxford hat on, um, uh, then um, I very much expect to see uh, this is a, if scan Z is your specification, then it's uh, it's a specification of, of what you should do to implement scan A. But usually, exactly uh, what right. is data refinement that way around. You start off with a spec to derive the program. You're doing it the opposite way around. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I started with the mystery. Right. You're and the I to know what was the original yeah. program? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's it, it's not just like any old program that satisfies it. All right. I mean, it, it is going to be some program that satisfies it, but it's really going to be a program that gets to the essence of the matter. Yeah, it'll be interesting to know 
to have a formal definition of essence in that sense, but uh, maybe yes, this will come out later. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. So here, here's a, a quite simple implementation of scan then, uh, and uh, based on this data type. Uh, and so if, if we scan the, the um, uh, if we scan the, a leaf, right? Then because it's an exclusive scan, but the, leaf, the tree we get out is gonna have just zero in it, okay? Here I'm generalizing from addition and zero to an arbitrary monoid. Monoid just means that you have a, an associative operation and an identity for it. So I, I may say, uh, I'll say zero, but I really mean the identity element in the monoid. Okay, so if you start with, with a, the kind of single to tree, the tree with just one element, you're gonna get zero out as the output tree, okay? And then the summary of the whole thing is gonna be the value of that leaf. If we have a branch, Okay, then we're going to recursively scan the two subtrees, okay? and then that the uh, the first uh, the first subtree is exactly correct. We're going to just include it as the first uh, tree of, uh, that's output by the scan, the first recursive result. Okay, that we're going to output, and the second one we're going to have to adjust. What do we have to adjust it by the summary of the first one? Okay, so that's what's happening here. We adjust all the elements, and then we have to also adjust the uh, the total. So we combine the two totals. This algorithm uh, does indeed have depth log in, but it has work in log in, okay? So it's, it's not the work efficient algorithm that we're looking for, okay? Now I wanna take some steps and get to the, the, the right algorithm, but I'm gonna do it by a little bit of refinement. The first refinement is, is uh, just to be able to put the size information into the data type. So I'm refining the type of trees and saying what the depth is. And, and I'm not just adding information, I'm also restricting the, the trees. So you can have all kinds of unbalanced trees in this representation. And the second one, they're gonna be only perfect trees. So that's the first refinement is to talk about binary uh, perfect leaf trees. So we added this uh, numeric index and we're gonna say that uh, a, a tree that is a leaf has depth zero. And if you have two trees of the same depth D, and you join them together with a the branch, then you get a, a tree of uh, depth D plus one. So now we describe perfect binary trees. Okay. And the algorithm, the, the kind of computational part is exactly the same. Nothing's changed at all, we've just refined the types. Okay, so it's of course still the, uh, the work inefficient algorithm. All right, let's see what this looks like. This is computation top down, tree scan. This is uh, size 16, size 32, and size 64. All right. So it's the wrong algorithm. I mean, it's a fine algorithm. It's just not the one we're looking for, but it's the right answer. So, so th this property holds, okay. or you can say we, uh, that the scan T is correct, but uh, also you can say if scan T is the specification, then scan A is correct. It is consistent in this diagram. <clears throat> All right, now I wanna refine uh, this guess again. <clears throat> And what I wanna do here is it's, it's a very small clerical step. And that is to say, in, instead of a branch having two trees, we're gonna say it has a pair of trees, okay? That's all. So if two trees, it's a pair of trees. Of course, it's exactly the same thing. I'm just making the pairness explicit. All right. The next step is more significant. <clears throat> and here I wanna introduce an explicit scan over pairs. All right. So if we look at, there we go. Yeah. So, um, so now we're going to say, in addition to doing scans over trees, we want to do scans over pairs. And that's very simple. It's a simple constant time operation. A pair just has a value X and a value Y. And so the new pair out is going to be zero and X, because remember it's exclusive. And then the summary element is going to be X plus Y. Okay. And then now instead of two calls to scan, well, of course, there's still really two calls to scan, but it, it's, it's it, uh, as a map over pairs. Okay, so now maybe a, remember a branch is now a pair of trees. And so here we are uh, recursively scanning uh, the, 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 um, each of the trees in that pair. Okay. So it's really doing exactly the same work. It's just rearranged a bit. And it's not actually doing the same work. It's doing more work because it's adding zeros. This zero is getting uh, used to adjust. Okay, but that's easily optimized away, those zero pluses. All right. Now we can take a step, now we can do a small change and get a, a quite significant change in the result. So here we had a pair of trees. That's the wrong guess. The right guess is a tree of pairs. Okay. So top down trees, a branch node ha has a pair of trees. Bottom up trees, a branch node has a tree of pairs. 
So this is a non-regular data type or nested data type. But as you can see, the code is really essentially the same. I've, I've swapped some what's a tree, what's a pair around a bit, but otherwise it's exactly the same algorithm. And here we, in the top down, we had in log in work. Now we have only in work. Why is that? It's really because in the top down case, we made two recursive calls. And then we did a linear amount of, of cleanup work. Okay, so we divided the problem in two, did two recursive calls and a linear amount of, of cleanup work. Whenever you have that pattern, you get this, uh, you get in log in work and that follows from the master theorem. In the bottom up, we instead have a single recursive call here. And then we have several non-recursive scans because they're over the pairs. Okay, so we have a linear number of, of pair scans, each of which is constant work. So we have a single recursive call and then some linear work. And that pattern always gives you uh, linear work. Okay. So, so that's, that's the difference. This is really one algorithm. It's not two algorithms. It's really one algorithm that's sort of parameterized in a sense by, uh, by how we're composing uh, pairs and trees. All right. And the answer is correct. Sorry, what, Connell, where does the tree of pairs come from? That wasn't part of the input structure. Do you zip two trees together somewhere? Well, remember, Simon, we're, um, so the, the, the raw input is, is uh, an array or purports to be an array. Uh -huh. The puzzle is what data structure does that uh, array represent, okay? So you, if you choose the kind of um, the more popular, if you make the more popular choice, the I call top-down trees, you have to make the translation. It's not very hard. You just divide the, you see whether your index is in the lower half or the upper half, and you decide whether you're going to investigate the lower tree. Or the, for, uh, but you, so your answer is, is that it's the parser that constructs the tree of pairs. That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. It's the parser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. You got it. Okay. All right, now let's compare. This is the top down, the previous uh, scan. This is the bottom up, okay? So again, they're both 16 elements, top down, bottom up. 32, we get top down, bottom up. See, it's, it's quite a different sort of flavor. 64, top down, bottom up, all right? So what I want you to notice is, is that the, the, um, the bottom up algorithms are uh, sparser in effort because indeed they are, they do only linear amount of work. They're also, however, wider. So there, there's a, uh, a small constant factor increase in the depth. So it's still linear, but it is larger and that does matter. Uh, and then there, there's an asymptotic improvement in the work. All right. So this sort of process of, of asking, take this uh, array algorithm, which you might consider the output of a compiler, right? And, and then say, ask, what's the essential, uh, wh what's the best data structure uh, through, uh, that explains this algorithm? Okay. If, uh, if I think of, of this array as an unparsing of a data structure, okay, what data structure makes solving this problem the simplest? So that, that's the kind of, uh, that, that, that's the approach. And then uh, we can use this style in a variety of different problems. It doesn't just apply to scan. So another one that I looked at is, is fast Fourier transform. There's a paper generic functional parallel algorithms that, that uh, gives these two examples and goes into depth. And I had a hunch going into FFT, which, which is that exactly the same two data types, the top down and bottom up uh, uh, binary leaf trees explain the classic uh, FFT algorithms, decimation and time, decimation and frequency. And that hunch turned out to be exactly correct. Okay. So if we, uh, we re-explain FFT in terms of top-down trees, we get this algorithm, which is exactly decimation in time. If we uh, it explain it in terms of bottom-up trees, we get this algorithm, decimation and frequency. So what I'm saying is there's really a kind of a, a, a type parameter tries algorithm, a single one, of which decimation and, and time and frequency are both special cases but there are a lot of other examples. And then similarly with scan. Okay, this is, uh, I think these were 16 elements. These are complex elements. So there's 32 real valued inputs. This is 32, top down, bottom up. Okay. Now, uh, I don't wanna just explain these known algorithms. I really wanna get a, a sense of the bigger picture here. And so, um, uh, uh, and so there's an important insight, which is that, uh, Binary leaf trees are not a kind of primitive data structure. They themselves are decomposable. So, if, uh, so of what is a binary leaf tree built? OK, 
Okay? And, there, and there's a very small uh, universal vocabulary, which you can build those data types and all kinds of other data types. And key is these three building blocks, singletons, products, and compositions. Okay? So a binary tree, remember, it involves pairs. Well, a pair is a product of singletons. Okay? So if, if you have, if you have a, a leaf, that's a singleton. So a singleton is just, it's the data structure that gained one value of interest. A product is, is you have two data structures and I want both of them. And a composition is, is a, a structure of structures. So the general idea is take a parallel algorithm, decompose it into fundamental building blocks, each corresponding to one of the, the um, fundamental building blocks of data types. And then just as you can recompose those uh, data types, type building blocks into complex data types or rich data types. Uh, analogously, you can use exactly the same recipe, uh, build the, um, what, the atoms of the algorithm into uh, interesting powerful molecules, algorithms, okay? And so then when, when you put them together, you get, uh, if, if you do this decomposition, put them together, you get infinite families of correct parallel algorithms. And they're all on uh, data types called tries or generalized tries or generalized generalized tries. Uh, and each of those data structures is isomorphic to an array. And the isomorphism between these tries and arrays is exactly what I've been calling parsing and unparsing. Okay, so how do we understand this isomorphism, the parsing, unparsing isomorphism? And that's really key because it explains the relationship between arrays and natural composable data types. And the key is really these uh, four laws of exponents. Okay, so if you took algebra in middle school or high school, uh, you would have learned these laws. And they say the following, uh, if you have a number A, right, and some exponent, then, then if you raise A to the zero, you get one, A to the one is A, a to the m plus n is a to the m multiplied by a to the n. And then a to the m times n is a to the m, and then that result raised to the n. Okay. So that's one interpretation of, of these rules. But these are really kind of a Rosetta Stone. Uh, the, these, these rules um, give explanations for, uh, for several important phenomena. So the, the next interpretation we can get by uh, understanding A not as a number, but as a type, okay? So if A is a type, then we have uh, on the left arrays. So A to the zero means an array of zero elements, okay? And an array of zero elements is isomorphic to, so now we're gonna change the equalities to isomorphisms, it's isomorphic to the unit type. That's, that's the type of which there's only one of them and it has no information in it. And no information to distinguish it from any other, that's why there's one. And a to the one, that, that's an array of size one, that's really isomorphic just to a single value a. And now if we have an array of size m plus n, right, you can think about partitioning that array into the first m elements and the last n elements. And if you do that, you can see that, that your one array is isomorphic to a pair of arrays, one of size m, one of size n. And then finally, if you have an array that has m times n elements, you can think about chopping that at every, say, m, m elements, and how many of those uh, segments are there gonna be? There'd be n of them. And so we have an, an, a size n array of size m arrays, okay? So that, that's a nested array or two-dimensional array. Now, another interpretation is, is, that, um, is that we're talking about functions, okay? And so uh, exponentials and functions are, are intimately connected with each other. So if you, have, if you think of the, uh, the, the type A to the N, you can think of that as being a function from N to A. So what do I mean when I say N is a type? What I mean is a type that has N elements, okay? So uh, if you have a function from, uh, from the void type, the type with zero elements, right? Zero to A, there's exactly one such thing. So there's no information content. If, if, if you have uh, a function from the unit type to A, there's really no more information than a single A value and so on, okay? Uh, this, this last uh, one is the Currying isomorphism. And the second to last one is, is a, a common isomorphism in Haskell. It's called either or uh, triple plus, I mean, uh, triple ampersand, um, triple bar, vertical bar, that's what it's called, okay? Uh, and then- Connell, another... there's, a, there's a question from Nikhil in the chat. Right. Um, I think referring to your uh, the, the circuit diagrams you had where you were counting the, the amount of work, uh, he, yeah. he asks, this is counting the arithmetic work. What yes. about the data traversal work? Uh, following, uh, following tree path versus array index. Uh, thank you for asking that question. There is no data traversal work. Um, so um, I think what it 
I didn't make clear there on that question is, uh, is that there's a story which, which is you, you can explain scan A by doing a parse, a scan Z here, scan T, and then that unparse, right? But that, but, um, that would be a very expensive implementation if you actually converted it into like a heap data structure and you did all this kind of uh, traversals and following pointers, right? And going through the heap, that's gonna be a very uh, expensive algorithm. I'm aiming at extremely uh, efficient algorithms and in particular uh, fabricating hardware from these algorithms. So there's not even gonna be a heap. So, so the, this, ex, this is a story that you have these three phases and you're composing, but actually is it all gonna be fused? So the, the idea is we want to understand algorithms, we want to program at this uh, nice sort of uh, compositional, simple, elegant, generalizable level. But then uh, there's going to be a really important optimization step performed by the compiler, performed by uh, the person uh, who, who's doing it. And, and what I'm talking about right now is exactly how you do that uh, uh, fusion or, or what the unparsing is, right, and what the rules are. And so the idea is that, is that we simply fuse the parsing and unparsing together with the computation. <clears throat> so I'd say there really is the, the only work that's being done really is the numeric operations. There's, uh, um, there's another effort, I'm not sure what word to use for it, uh, another cost, which is, of course, data communication. <clears throat> and that's not trivial, and that, in fact, dominates. Uh, data communication is more expensive uh, than computation, uh, whether it's in hardware or software. I mean, it's a silly thing to say, software runs in hardware. So um, because we're running physically, there, there is this expense and it's a significant expense. So I, I don't want to dismiss it, but, but there, there is nothing about like traversing data structures. But the, the, um, the circuit diagrams you've shown, is the, are they just topological or are they, um, is the, does the length carry any meaning? Of the lengths of these edges? There's a longer edge of oh, a longer oh, data oh. path. No, or? this is no. Th this is just a layout. This is just some. Uh, uh, I generate dot files, and then there's this graph viz uh, program that will render the graphs for me. So just think of it as topological. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. All right. Uh, and then, so a final interpretation here is is that is that we have uh, two types. Uh, uh, that the what the base and the exponents are types, and we're talking about tries here. So, and and tries and functions are are isomorphic to each other. So, a try is is just a, a memoization of a function. Okay, so a memoization is converting functions into data structures that capture exactly the same information. All right. So now I want to reify this this notion that there are these basic building blocks. Oh, and then I should say this, what I'm showing you, um, if you think about tries, uh, functions, these four equations are, um, are the implementation of memoization. This defines how memoization works. Okay. And it also suggests a collection of data structures, and, and that's, these data structures are right here. So we, these are collections. We have the, the unit, and that contains um, no information, so there's exactly one of them, and there's zero values in it. And then the identity, which has a single value. And now we have products of structures, uh, so a product of F and G uh, uh, is going to have uh, an F structure of A values and a G structure, uh, okay? And then a composition is going to be this nested structure, a G of F of A. So given this vocabulary, now we can write down these isomorphisms. So, uh, and, uh, and these isomorphisms are, are kind of the, the heart of the matter of how to relate uh, high-level data types, composable data types with these kind of low-level arrays. Okay. Now, these isomorphisms are not just facts. They're, they're not just true. They're constructively true. They, they carry computational content. Okay, so we, we don't just know that this is true. We know how to convert between them. Okay. And so we can actually have a little vocabulary, a little library of isomorphisms, of computational isomorphisms. So there's going to be the, the isomorphism that relates uh, zero area arrays to the unit and one uh, raise of size one to the identity. Right? And now if we have a couple of isomorphisms, we know that, F, that, that uh, arrays of size M represent uh, the more natural data type F, right? And if size N represents G, then array of size M plus N represents this product. Okay, and similarly, ar arrays of product sizes represent computations. And we can encode uh, we can uh, uh, represent explicitly this isomorphism computationally as a parser and an unparser and a proof of, uh, of invertibility. And in fact, we really only need one direction of invertibility. We need that. Uh, I think it's unparsing followed by parsing is the identity. Okay. 
Now, I said these are the basic building blocks. How do we get more familiar data types? And so let me check on the time here. Okay. All right. So one familiar kind of data type is the vector. And a, an in-airy vector is just the uh, in-airy product of the identity. Okay. So remember, each of these, uh, the identity contains one element. So if you have n of those, you have n elements. But there's really two kinds of vectors. There, there's the cons vectors that, that uh, uh, point rightward and the snock vectors that point leftward. Okay, what I mean by point rightward is, is that uh, the, the most accessible element is the first one, is the leftmost one, I should say. Okay, that's a cons vector. A snock vector, the most accessible element is the last one, the rightmost one. So we can define, this is in Haskell, define these data types. So a, a, a zero, um, yeah, a, a vector of length zero is just this unit, there's nothing in it. A vector of length D plus one is, well, the singleton and the vector of length D. So this just looks like the definition of a, a, a vector, a, a list or a, a length index list. And then it has the, the it's a reversal, which is that you grow, uh, you grow leftward. Okay, so that's vectors. What about trees? Well, trees are really just about as easy, except instead of doing repeated products and do repeated compositions. So here, imagine that H is pair, which is just I cross I. Right? So if you take pair and compose it with itself D times, that's exactly uh, a perfect binary tree of depth D. Okay, is it a right? Uh, is, is it a top down or is it bottom up? Well, it all depends on how the composition is associated. So no matter how it's associated, we're going to get an, uh, all, any association will give you an isomorphic result. So no matter how you associate it, uh, all, all the possible results are going to be isomorphic to each other, but they're going to suggest very different, uh, uh, they're going to have very different computational interpretations, okay? And, and they'll, they'll give you different complexities. So a top-down uh, a to, a top down binary leaf tree is going to be fully right associated. The bottom up is going to be fully left associated. That's all that's going on here. Okay. All right, but we can try all kinds of other things. And um, there's this paper by uh, Beard and Mer Mertens, Bird and Mertens, uh, called Nested Data Types. And that paper had a, a bush type. Um, and I didn't use exactly that type, but I used something that was inspired by it. And so I'm, I'm calling that bushes are here. I'm calling it two to the two to the. So this, this uh, data type, two to the two to the, it's parameterized by a depth D. And whereas binary trees grow uh, in their capacity, grow exponentially with the depth, bushes grow doubly exponentially. So remember a binary tree, you've got uh, the branch is a pair of trees or a tree of pairs. But for bushes, it's gonna be a bush of bushes. Okay? And so uh, instead of repeatedly doubling or repeatedly squaring. And so the, the size of one of these things, two to the two to the D, I should have said here, uh, is in fact, two to the two to the D. Okay? And just as um, you can think of a binary tree as being, um, well, a binary tree, you can, fit, you can write it with products instead of compositions. Uh, and if you, if you fully right associate, you get, you get cons vectors, left associate, you get snock vectors. We don't want to do that, we want to do trees. So if you, if you uh, associate in a balanced sort of way, that's where you get trees and so you get fast um, work, I'm sorry, depth efficient parallel algorithms, okay? So, but trees are only balanced with respect to products. They're completely unbalanced with respect to composition. So this is the data type that, that gets you balanced with respect to composition. And it's easily generalized beyond, you know, the pairing here and the squaring here. So is this an interesting, useful data type? Who knows? But it was very easy to try, so I tried it. Okay. So this is scan uh, for bushes. So remember what I mean. I, I showed you scan for bottom up and scan for top down. But I also showed you that the, the top down and bottom up were essentially the same algorithm, right? And that's because the essence of both algorithms is how does scan work on uh, singletons on products and on compositions. So once, once you decompose the algorithm into those pieces, you can put them together in anything else, including a bush. And so this is the bush scan, and that's the bush FFT. Now, I can't tell looking from these pictures whether this is an algorithm worth pursuing. I can't show you, I mean, I could show you one, uh, one step up from here, but bushes grow so fast that there would be like one mass here. You couldn't see any structure in it. Okay, so I did some measurements. Um, so here we have three different uh, representations. Uh, they all have size 16. We have uh, bottom, uh, 
a top down tree of, of depth four, bottom up depth four, and a bush of depth two. So all of these have size 16. And if you look at the work in the depth, you can see, well, the bush one does um, it, uh, the amount of work it does is in between the other two and the amount of, and the depth is in between. So I don't know, some kind of funny compromise. Not, not at all clear that this is a win, but it's a, it's an interesting result. And we go up to size 256, this pattern uh, continues. So for scans, uh, Bush has seemed to give a kind of compromise. So what happens for FFT? Well, for FFT, it turns out to be a win in both cases. So um, a Bush FFT beats the, uh, the top down bottom of tree FFT. And remember, these are the popular algorithms for um, the top down and bottom up are the popular algorithms for FFT. Uh, and civilization largely runs on FFT. I mean, this is a really important algorithm. So if we look here, this uh, the Bush FFT beats uh, the classic algorithms, decimation of time and frequency in work and in depth. And that uh, same is true for uh, size 256. So that's very interesting. Um, I think this is a completely new algorithm, just as the scan was. Um, uh, it's possible somebody's done this before. I, I'm not an algorithms expert, so I might not know. But also because I'm not an algorithms expert, um, I think what's most impressive to me is that uh, is that I put very little work into this, and, and I had very little uh, what deep technical background to draw on in terms of algorithm design and data structures. Um, but it was really easy to try. It was easy to come up with this data type and it was easy to try adapting these algorithms. And so whether this algorithm is a big win uh, in practice or not, I don't know, um, but, uh, but, but something else uh, might be. Uh, and it's quite easy to find out, okay. So winding down here, um, one objection I sometimes hear from about this kind of work is, is a kind of, but computers something or other. And in this case, uh, it might be, but computer memory is arrays, right? So your, your computer has arrays, it, it, it's kind of built in, uh, so you should be using it. And for some people that either is, uh, uh, it's maybe a, a notion of naturalness, I'm doing something unnatural, something, uh, uh, or it's just inefficient. Okay, but um, I think this kind of objection is really fundamentally misguided. Uh, and so, so for one thing, um, if computers are built out of arrays in terms of memory, um, that's fine. It uh, doesn't mean we have to program in those terms. We can systematically convert natural algorithms to array algorithms to accommodate. And, and I've, I've shown you at least an outline of how to do that. But secondly, the claim just isn't true. Computer memory isn't arrays. It's perfect binary leaf trees. <clears throat> if you think about uh, a chip that implements memory, um, what's the capacity? It's two to the D, all right? So that's already a clue that something funny is going on. And how is it implemented? Well, it's really a try. It's really a lookup. What you give an address is uh, a, a sequence of bits. And a sequence of bits, a sequence of Booleans, is the natural index type for the try uh, that is either a top-down or bottom-up um, binary leaf tree. <clears throat> Okay, so computer memory really is uh, these nice, lovely compositional data structures, not arrays. Okay, and also it, it doesn't matter uh, if, if if it really was arrays, you could uh, you could uh, accommodate, adapt to it. So, in conclusion, I wanted to share with you today an alternative to uh, array programming, what I call the Fortran uh, paradigm uh, of data, which is multi-dimensional arrays. Nowadays, people are calling them tensors, but they're really multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, and the highlights of this alternative is that it reveals the essence of an algorithm, the connections among algorithms. Like I did not know going in that top down and bottom up that these two classic well-known uh, scan algorithms were in fact a special cases of the same algorithm. And I certainly didn't know that about uh, FFT. I might've had some sort of hunch a while back about uh, scan, but uh, FFT, that was, that was uh, quite surprising. And I don't think this is a widely known fact. Uh, these computations can be written free, of, in, uh, free of, uh, of indexing, so it's a higher level form rather than a lower level form, uh, and therefore it's safer uh, and it's less cluttered. On the other hand, if you want to use indexing, fine, but you can use non-numeric indexing, so the, the natural index type, every try has a natural index type, uh, and, and when you program using those uh, indices, it is entirely safe. You don't have to uh, run the risk of a runtime error and out of bounds, which could be catastrophic. Uh, and you don't have to pay the cost of, of um, you know, runtime checking of the bounds. OK, 
Okay. And then we can translate array of, from these natural algorithms into array programs safely and systematically, and I believe automatically, and even generate proofs of correctness in the process. So uh, I've, I've shown you and, and mentioned four <clears throat> very well-known parallel algorithms, two for scans, two for FFTs, that turn out to be special cases of, of very simple, very general algorithms on the top down and bottom of the trees. Um, those algorithms uh, lead to, or that perspective leads to simple variations, like uh, you can generalize from pair to, uh, to some other structure, any other structure you want, uh, and you get a correct algorithm. Um, you can also uh, generalize from uniform compositions like pair, 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 pair. Uh, it's, you could replace pair by something else like uh, quadruples. That's actually a, a pretty uh, useful choice in FFTs, for instance. But you can also choose not to do uniform. You could do like a, a, a pair and a composed with a quadruple, composed with a five tuple and a sextuple and another pair and so on. Um, and, and again, those algorithms all fall out just kind of automatically and they're all uh, correct. Um, and that's known as uh, for FFT, a multi-radix algorithm, but it turns out that you can do exactly the same thing with scans. Okay. And then it was, turned, uh, it was very easy to discover two uh, new algorithms, one for scan, one for FFT on this uh, uh, type of bushes the one that uh, grows doubly exponentially, that squares at every level, uh, seems to be useful. Uh, we have to find out you know, in practice whether the constant factors uh, work out nicely or not. Okay. I've explored a bunch of other examples, uh, hardware arithmetic algorithms, so fast parallel uh, addition. Uh, linear algebra can be done in a, a, a nice compositional way. Um, People often think uh, that linear algebra is about matrices and matrices are arrays. Well, it's really not. Linear algebra is about linear transformations. Uh, those transformations can be represented by matrices, but even in that case, matrices um, are, are a natural outcome if you think of vectors as being uh, in tuples, but vectors don't have to be in tuples. Vectors can be actually any try uh, uh, forms of vector space. And so if you think about linear algebra a little more loosely, you get a safe compositional parallel friendly algorithms for linear algebra as well. Uh, polynomial evaluation due in logarithmic time. I didn't know that uh, until I looked at it through this lens, turns out to be the case. Bitonic sort is a, what's called an oblivious sort that happens to be uh, very useful for hardware implementations. So all of these algorithms have log parallel time implementations and they're all, they all kind of fall out of this uh, natural structure. And now I want to mention a general lesson, which is that, uh, which is about optimization. So optimization matters because, of course, we want our implementations to be efficient, uh, which means uh, low running time, but also low energy consumption, uh, particularly nowadays. That's an increasingly important concern. Um, and, but optimization itself harms something really fundamental, which, which is a clarity of understanding. And, and al um, array introduction is that kind of optimization. So if you introduce arrays, uh, it may, depending on what your machine pretends to be, if it pretends to be an array algorithm, if you have an instruction set on a parallel machine, like a, a, an Intel or, a, or a, an ARM processor, uh, it's a parallel machine with a, a sequential looking instruction set, you may be rewarded for an array implementation. But uh, thinking about your problem in terms of arrays is going to hide the essential nature of it, okay? And it's going to thwart clarity and composability. So it's fine. Just uh, think about it in terms of these more natural composable data types. Uh, extract clarity, uh, form generalizations, try out uh, variations and so on, okay? And then encode the results in terms of arrays, either you manually or a uh, compiler, okay? So do optimization, but do it late. That's the general lesson here. And I think that's it. I'd be happy to take questions.